So in this third video from chapter three, we are going to look at experimental research designs. Uh, this is the one method that you can use to end up with what's called a causal statement at the end of the study. A causal statement meaning that you know, if the experiment works, you can end up saying, I have shown that variable A causes a change in variable B. There is no other method besides using a, an experimental research design to end up with such a powerful kind of statement saying that you've found a cause for, you know, behavior change. And there's a number, number of steps that have to be followed um, in order for it to be considered a, a true experiment or a true experimental research design. Um, when a researcher designs an experiment, the goal is to control as many aspects of the, of the experimental situation as possible in order to draw conclusions about the causes of the outcome. Typically, um, you know, we talked earlier about laboratory versus naturalistic studies and you know be, as it says here we want to control the situation so this is to you know experiments are typically laboratory type studies um so that you can have control over the situation uh, because you want to make sure you, the basic logic is we're going to have two group you know i'm going to start with a simple case we have two groups of subjects we're going to change one thing between the two groups. And then we're going to see if it has an effect on some other data, some other variable. So I'm going to change. I have two groups. I do something a little bit different with one group. I make sure everything else is the same between the two groups. I change one thing. And then if I get, if I measure some data and the data is different between the two groups, it must have been that one thing I changed that caused the difference. That is the, the kind of the basic simple logic. And so that's why you need a lot of control. You wanna make sure there's only one thing different between the two groups and keep everything else identical. So let's look at the components and, and the terms of an experiment. First of all, one thing that's uh, critically important to be considered a, a true experiment you need random assignment of participants. And, uh, and I'm just going to be continue talking about, you know, the, the simple case of, of a, a, two, a two group study. I mean, you, you can have studies with, they're much more complicated, but so in a, in a simple experiment, you, you're going to have two groups. One group gets what we call the treatment. The other group does not get the treatment. That's going to be the one thing that's different between the two groups. Um, but first of all, so we're randomly assigning people. Random assignment means that each participant in the study must have an equal chance of being in either group, okay? So each participant must have an equal chance of being in either group. So you cannot do a true experiment if you start with pre-existing groups, for instance. If I do a study comparing teaching methods and I use a class, an MCC class versus a University of Rochester class, that is not a true experiment. You people did not have an equal chance of being in either condition. If I'm doing, you know, a different, I'm calling one of the classes experiment and one control. And then, so you always have to ask yourself, did each member in this experiment have an equal chance of being in either group? And so, and, and that must be the case. Okay, now back to where it says treatment you either get the treatment or you don't get the treatment. Treatment's in quotes because treatment is a very broad term. It is the one thing that you're doing different that, that, that's under study, that you're studying. Uh, it can be anything. So treatment doesn't have to be like some kind of medical thing. I mean, it gets its name from, you know, originally uh, medical studies where, you, where you're testing drugs or something. That, one group gets the actual drug, the other group does not get the actual drug and they get a placebo pill. But um, 
treatment, once again, it can be anything. Um, if I'm testing, well, let's say I'm te testing a new learning method. Um, I, I think I have a, a, a new, or let's say a new teaching method, okay? Well, one class would get the new teaching method. The other class would, would not get the new teaching method. They would get the old treatment, or the old teaching method, excuse me. So the teaching would be, the, I'm sorry, the treatment would be the teaching method. Um, if I'm studying a memory aid, I think that um, there's, a, there's a memory aid I can introduce the students to, to improve their memories, and that memory aid is, is considered a treatment. Um, okay. So whatever you're changing between the two groups is the treatment. Um, the experimental group gets it, the control group does not. The, so the control group is your baseline group. You're going to compare the experimental group to the control group. Like, you know, are they different? Did, did the treatment cause some results to be different um, in the experimental versus the control, the control baseline group? Um, two terms that are important, you always have an independent and a dependent variable. The independent variable is, is whether the individual receives the treatment or not. So the independent variable is the one thing that separates the two groups. It is the treatment, basically. The, the independent variable is, did you get the treatment or not? And then there's going to be a dependent variable. And this is the data that you measure to see if the independent variable had some kind of effect. So if I'm predicting that students will, students grades will improve when I use this new teaching method, then the, the independent variable is the teaching method. The dependent variable is going to be the students grades. Because in every experiment, the question is, does the independent variable cause a change in the dependent variable? So if I, if I, use the new teaching method and I find out that their grades go up, the grades are the dependent variable, then I say, aha, the teaching method causes a rise in grades because everything else was the same between the two groups except for the teaching method. All right. So once again, just to, to summarize independent variable, it's a one thing done differently between the two groups. The variable is the data. And, and the, I've used this memory aid since I was uh, a young college student. Dependent starts with D, data starts with D. I always think, okay, it's the data I'm collecting. It's the, kind of like the numbers, like the grade, in that last uh, example would be the grades. That's the data I'm collecting to see, you know, is there an effect? And so dependent variable is always the data. Okay? And, and, it's, and it tells us, the, the data is going to tell us, did the independent variable, the treatment, have an effect or not. So let's look at an, at an example, uh, you know, a labeled example. This is, a, oops, it didn't click. Okay, here we go. This is from your book. I'm not going to go through this example. I want you to go through it. Make sure you understand the different parts. Basically, the treatments attending Head Start or not, and they want to see if scores change among the, the students, uh, the, the young children. And so the, you know, the, these cognitive and behavioral scores are going to be the dependent variable. Attending Head Start or not is going to be the independent variable. So I've just summarized it for you. But I like a picture. So you guys can go through that more closely yourselves. I've added a slide. You don't have this slide. So if you want, you can pause the video and, and draw it out if you want. But I, I like a picture. So I, I took this from my adolescent class and just added it here. So. In this um, experimental study, they're, they're interested in whether a time management program can improve adolescent, the adolescent's grades. So I've labeled it. So at the, at the top, it says, it says that participants are randomly assigned to experimental and control groups. Once again, this is a critical step. You, it, it, and, and just believe me, if, 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 you, if this doesn't occur, you cannot trust the results. Um, the, the, you, it has to be that everyone had an equal chance of being in either group. So there's, there's no bias in one group versus the other. So that's the random assignment part. That's called random assignment. Okay, so the, we split them up just into two groups, flipping a coin or picking random numbers or something, using, using any kind of random method to decide who goes in which group. 
And the independent variable is the variable that split is the one thing that's going to be different between the two groups. So I, I want to study this time management program. That's going to be what I give the experimental group. Yeah. So the experimental group always receives the treatment. The time management program is the treatment. The control group, they're not going to get the treatment. No time management program for them. Okay. So, hey, let's see if this time management program changes something in these groups. So that's the independent variable. And I want to see if there's a change in what, what would make sense in this case would be the student's grades. I'm I'm testing if the time management program helps improve grades. So obviously I'm going to measure their actual grades that they receive. Um, so the measurement, the dependent variable is always going to be the same for both groups. Okay, so you're not going to have separate data for each group. Like you know, you're going to collect separate data, but it's always going to be the same variable. So you know, both groups are going to have their grades measured. And that's the dependent variable. Once again, D dependent and data, both start with D. And the question that we're always asking in any experiment, you can see on the left, the cause and the effect in every experiment is, does the independent variable cause an effect in the dependent variable? And then and, and if you do the experiment right and the data supports that, that the two groups are different, then you can all, you can end up, you know, making a cause, what I remember I said earlier, a causal statement. I have found that this time management program causes um, grades to to rise in, in amongst the amongst adolescents. So I, I I've actually found that, that you know this program works that it causes a change. Okay, so that's a, a kind of a straightforward simple example, and this is how this is the basic of logic and how every experiment works. It can be, it can be much more complex, as I said. Just to give you one quick example, I mean, remember I, earlier I said you want to just change one thing between the groups. Imagine how silly it would be if, if my in my experimental group I gave them a time management program, and I also gave them some additional study aids, and then the control group got nothing. Then you know if I find that the grades rise. I won't have any idea if it was at the time management program or was it the study aids that I gave them that caused the grades to rise. That would be kind of, you know, a, a, a silly waste of time. It would be a bad experiment. You only want to change one thing at a time. Now it's possible I want to study both at once, a time management program and I have a set of study aids I also, also think might rise, raise grades. You know, if I was to do that study, I would have four groups. I would have one that received only the time management program, one group that received only the study aids. There would be a third group that received both. And there would be a fourth group, the control group that received nothing. And by comparing those four groups, I could figure out, does the time management program raise grades? Does the study aids raise grades? Combined, do they raise grades? more, you know, and, and they, and so, you know, you can build up more complex studies. Okay. Now I've mentioned the word true, true experiment a couple of times. I said that to, you have to have a random assignment in order for it to be considered a true experiment. We also have what's called natural or quasi experiments. These are not true experiments. They, and, and you have to, um, if be very cautious in interpreting the results of these studies, because because they if there was no random assignment used, once again you you can't always trust um, uh, the res the results are not as straightforward. You can't can't there's no easy conclusions that you can trust. Um, so it, this is this is a case where where um, you know there are pre existing groups that have a difference between them. You know, one simple, simple, the simplest example I give you is if there's ever a study that's testing males versus females, it's a, it's a natural quasi experiment. I mean, like, I can't randomly assign people and say, okay, you're going to be male in the study, you're going to be female, you'll be male, you'll be female. I mean, like, it's obviously impossible to do. 
So, I mean, you know, any study comparing males versus females is, is not a true experiment. And you may be saying, oh, I want to see if males are different than females in this, in this way. But the thing is, males and females are different in many ways. And you won't know, you know, if it, it, which particular difference caused a difference in your data. Uh, let me give you an example of, of, um, that, um, that's that been done, an uh, example that was done. I think your book mentions it. Uh, they, there was a study that compared children of incarcerated mothers to children of mothers who reside with the children in their own homes. So they were looking at, you know, the effects on children where if they have a mother who's in jail or prison, incarcerated in, in some institution, and how it affects the children. I mean, this is obviously a, a, a natural or quasi experiment because you did not assign these people. I mean, you would you would have to make it a true experiment. You would start off with a bunch of subjects and then send half of them to 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 jail or prison um, <laughs> to see what kind of effect it has. Uh, but in this case, they're already they're already in there. They, you know, you you've contacted a number of incarcerated mothers that have children, you're comparing them to mothers at home. Now, here's the thing, we we might be interested in, does incarceration, you know, what kind of negative effects does it cause in the children? But the problem with pre-existing groups is, you know, these mothers that are incarcerated, they may not have been the best mothers even before they ever went to prison or jail. I mean, there's a reason they ended up getting incarcerated. And so like, to say like, oh, there's these negative effects because they're incarcerated. Well, you know what? Maybe those negative effects would have, been, would have existed even if those mothers were at home because there's something that led them to, you know, either bad behavior, negative behaviors or negative lifestyle that, that led them to be incarcerated in the first place. So whenever there's existing groups, there are often multiple differences between them. And, and, and you remember, we just want one difference. like. This group's incarcerated, those groups are not, but otherwise they're equal. Well, we can't say otherwise they're equal in this case. Mothers that end up incarcerated probably aren't the same as mothers that never come close to being incarcerated. I mean, okay. And this is, so if you ever hear, if you ever reading in, uh, about an experiment and they say it's a natural or it's a quasi experiment, remember, interpret the results cautiously. We cannot be as strong with our conclusions. You cannot end up with that, that firm statement, I found out that incarceration causes this difference in children. Well, we don't know that. Okay, and that concludes the experimental research design section. In the next section, we will look at correlational research.